So designers, we know from the work we did and the measurements we took, architects uh, usually use about 25% less resource to come up with their final designs. Now they don't like to say what they save in money, because they're worried someone's going to say we've got to reduce your fee. But the argument is you save that amount of money, you use less resource, but you put it back into the system to come up with a better design. I like that uh, as a quote. The contractor, cost names have already specified, on one of the test jobs we did, talking about case studies earlier, there is one at Enfield Town Centre, which you should look at, where the contractor actually doubled his margin. He took it from 2% to 4%. The client, at the same time, saved three million pounds on a 30 million pound contract. And these figures and the case studies, this keeps repeating itself. I hesitate slightly about saying reduce the cost. What they actually did was stop the client paying more than he should. Slightly different approach. It's not a saving, it's, it's stopping spending it before you get that. Okay. And this is where we are at the moment. Documents are out there, the government understands, he's seen the results, and they really want to drive this in place by 2016. So, what are we trying to do here? A need to reduce risk and costly errors, a need to reduce waste, reduce escalating project costs, deliver time to deadlines, manage the asset, asset life cycle to reduce cost and carbon. And these two are the things focused on cost and carbon. These were the original focus of all of this. At the moment we've dealt with cost, we are yet to complete and understand fully what the carbon means. We're trying to increase competition, but we're also, and the government now sees this whole thing, if we can upskill ourselves and we can do this better than anybody else in the world, and we are seen to be in that position, but we've yet to realise it, then this is about growth. This is about getting the country, part of it is about helping the country get out of the economic situation to win projects abroad, to employ people better, pay our wages, etc. So what's in it for me? Do this properly, and the possibilities of long-term employment and better money, promotion, whatever is there. And I'm not just saying that. I'm saying it because I started in this painting still work in Harrogate on a freezing cold site in November. And I'm still here now delivering this because I changed. I changed from being a still work painter to a structural engineer into IT, into business management, and now delivering standards and methodologies. We need to change. So, why are standards important? I think the answer to this is obvious, in a way, because we've shown it through here. If you follow a process that is said to work, is known to work, you will get the outcomes that we're looking for. Without a process, the outcome will be, as Einstein said, no different to what it's always been. And we need to look at the uh, standards in the use in the capital expenditure delivery. This is quite important. So spatial coordination, improve quality of information, reduce the cost in OPEX. We get to realise this exploitation of valuable data. It's the data that becomes important, the procurement process of that data, and the process provides is provided by activities downstream of design and construction and asset management. So the use of that data in process is downstream. Exploitation of the rich data procured during cap CapEx that further reduce operational costs, which have been estimated to be one, depends who you read, 200 times more <coughs> than the savings in CapEx. That's a massive amount of money at the end of the day. We're talking about the whole life cycle. <coughs> project. Do I have the right information to be able to maintain this building properly at the lowest cost? More importantly, if I use this process, can I end up with a better product, a better asset that doesn't need all of that money to maintain it, to be consumed? So, just to recap very quickly. PAS 1192 Part 2 extends PS 1192, we're going to have a look at that in a minute, uh, into the management and delivery of all data, not just in drawing. So, PS 1192 207 is about how you build models and how you generate drawings, documents, and data out of it. The PAS tells you how the whole life cycle uh, is managed. And the 
important thing to understand is that the process is equally useful for buildings and infrastructure. There's a big argument out there that because it says BIM, this is only about buildings. Got nothing to do with us on the railway, got nothing to do with us on the highways, it's only about buildings. Well, let's go back to where I started here. The driver that started this whole process was Heathrow Express. It was a railway. It was a tunnel. Terminal 5, what is that? Is that a building or is that a civil contract? Anybody want to guess? Make sure. It's a building. You could say that. Above ground, it's a building. Below ground, it's civil. Because there are tunnels, there are travelators, there are baggage handling equipment, there is so much stuff. Seven stories below ground. So it's a mixture. So it can be used on buildings and it can be used on infrastructure. It was also used on the M25. Brook Street Viaduct, one of the bridges down there, was also used in this methodology. So it works for everything. So we have to get rid of this thing, BIM, and look at collaborative work. Because <clears throat> that's what this is all about for any type of construction project. So the main purpose of the PAS is also to ensure that the employer, government client, and those tendering, you, Fully understand the needs of the project delivery. I need the client to write down, and the client has a responsibility in this, to tell, say exactly what he needs. He must come up with a better brief to get a better outcome. But it's also about levelling the playing field. No surprises at the end of the day. We know what we're tendering against. We can do this job. It's all written down. We know what our deliverables are. There will be no surprises. Surprises are when things don't fit, and you have to get the team together and figure out which ones should we, should we saw first. Thank you very much. You can ask questions as we go, if you want. It's a bit late now. But just in case there is something to, that uh, is uh, niggling you at the moment, I'll be quite happy to answer it. Or indeed, any questions at the end of this next little bit. Okay. What if the client doesn't know what he wants, Mother? Sorry? What if the client doesn't know what, they, what he actually wants? Then you're not going to deliver it to Because we have had that situation before. I'm sure you have. Yeah. And this is what must change. The client has a responsibility in ensuring that when he's procuring something, he must define exactly what he wants. Otherwise, how will he get what he, wants, what, he, what he needs for his business? As I said, at the moment, client, the, the government's client is being educated by a number of teams. So there are teams in the ministries actually teaching them how to fill out their EIRs, their employer's information requirement, to get a much more exacting group. In the private sector, we can all we can already see, and it's happening quite a bit now, that the contractor <coughs> is writing his own EIRs. So he wants to have a supply chain that's going to make him look good in his reaction to the client. But we must also understand one of the things we are seeing is that the contractor's client a lot of the major contractors are developers, be it by hospitals, be it by schools, etc., etc. They have to build these things for the best possible price, and they want to maintain them for the lowest possible price so that the outcome is greater profits. So the contractor as client has already seen the benefits of this method of working and wants it for himself. So we are beginning to see this change, and people have to understand that they must write the key. There are organisations already assembling themselves to help the client write those brief documents and emails. This is before any architect is really brought on board. Okay. Um, very quickly about this diagram, the life cycle management diagram uh, from the PAS. It's actually two diagrams in one. I wanted to go through this just so that you understand what this thing is saying. The bit in the middle is actually BS 1192207 and the delivery of information through a collaborative activity <coughs> through the plan of work stages. <coughs> For those that were observant, the point is, hang on a minute, that's about buildings again. Well, it is if you read this bit down here. We have 
those of us that develop this, to put numbers in here. These, you can put any different definition to the stage that you want. So if you're doing a rail project and you use the grip stages and apply those in the particular place in the delivery plan. So this becomes a flexible digital plan of work. Okay, this is very good. The blue line around the outside represents the management of the project from conception, from inception even, to final delivery into the operational phase and the use of that data to make decisions on what you're going to do with that building towards its end of life. Rebuild it, modify it, pull it down, don't do anything with it. So it's about the management of the project delivery, the data. So the client wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do something. I have a strategy. I'm going to procure somebody to do something for me. This is not a one-time procurement activity. This is a number of procurement activities, stages, and that's why these arrows are dis disconnected. I'm just going to employ somebody to do a brief for me. Who do I want? I'm going to put out a procurement document, the type of person I want, and what I want them to do for me. Puts that out, procures the team, and delivers it. And he's asking for a number of questions to be answered at each of those stages. So the first one might be quite simple. I want to build a 250 cell prison in Dartmoor and I don't want anybody to escape. That's the single simplest definition of what I want. And I've got this piece of land to put it on. And with those bits of information that I've just given you, you can work out how many prison cells can I get on the footprint of land that I've got. And if I can only get 25, then I'm going to need a 10 story building. And the cost of buildings by height changes with that height. So we start to develop a cost plan based on some very basic information. The floor <coughs> areas are known, there is a cost per square meter. Or we can do a cost by volume, whatever. So even at this stage, with the barest information, no model other than the one that I just suggested, you can actually derive a full cost plan for that type of building, for that type of facility. Yep, don't need an architect. This is a pure costing exercise. Once you get through that gate, and by the way, there is an iteration going on here. Give me the answer, don't like it, try it again, don't like it, don't like it. Oh, that one works. I'm now going to procure another team to move into concept. The architect comes on board, whoever <coughs> is the one that should be at that stage to help with the delivery. And so it goes on, answering those questions until we get this stage. The, the keys do change slightly, but this is a generic. So at this stage, we more or less have a fixed price, or at least we have a guaranteed maximum price <coughs> of some sort based on the brief. These prices do change in the brief. So I'm okay, I've got the answers I want, this is what I want to do. Now I'm going to procure the team to deliver it. No more questions need to be answered until the point of delivery. I'm happy, this is the design. These are the right contractors. This is the right procurement methodology. Deliver the project to me. Hand over the point. However, you have to, at each one of these stages, complete the data delivery required at each one of those stages. Now, I don't know whether you know, the industry usually goes on site, gets to be in three or four weeks of delivery, and goes, oh, we don't forget we've got to deliver all of the drawings, the documents, and all the data associated with they look around and everybody's running off the site. It's finished, it's closing down, don't need all these people here. They cannot find the information. We do not manage our information very well. Now for a moment, at Heathrow Express, after the tunnels collapsed, and the health and safety inspector had moved in, they couldn't find 30% of the information. It magically disappeared. Or perhaps it wasn't even there in the first place. It wasn't managed properly. What came out of that experience for BAA was that the, the health and safety inspector had said, on every one of your major projects, you must manage the delivery of the information, and I want a full audit trail of 
all of the transactions that went on in the process to deliver that project. So if anything happens, I can come in and understand where the roles and responsibilities are. Indeed, what I'm really looking for is the responsibility. So this is the process that manages that whole thing. The common data environment, as it's called delivering the model itself, is the thing that maintains the archive, the history of how it is delivered. So we now hand over stage six into the AIM, in for maintenance, etc. There is a new PAS, it's published this morning, if you haven't got it. All these things are free, by the way. Uh, this PAS, PAS 1192 part three, was uh, published this morning, uh, so you can download that now. And this is talking about how you hand over, how you validate the information that's handed over, and there is, at the moment, a basic methodology for managing that data, because the most important thing in use now is that we maintain the data. We do not let the data decay. Because what happens on major projects is they have the data set, they go out and change something, the door's fallen over, I punched a hole in that wall, I needed some other access. They don't update the drawings. They don't update the models. They don't update the data. That has to be maintained now throughout the whole process. That is also part of the procurement activity. Because you need this information to make decisions in the future, <coughs> possibly to build another one, or whatever that was, to take the learning from the one you did. This didn't work, that didn't work. So in my brief, I'm going to give you a different brief. Do not do that because it didn't work on this project. I want something different. So this asset information here is becoming more and more important for lots and lots of reasons which I won't go into at the moment. But certainly in making decisions as to what I now do with that building uh, is, is one of those <coughs> important things. Okay. So the suppliers have an exchange process, so they have to log how they're going to exchange information, what information do they need to exchange, and the client wants some information, some answers back to answer the questions for him to make commercial decisions on is this the right building, is it the right cost, is it in the right place. So that is the basis of this. So it's about collaboration and life cycle delivery. You'll notice that BIM is disappearing. What I've just shown you is just another way of articulating what we've actually always done but in a much more disciplined environment. What we've always done is this blue line and everything above it. So this is the normal stages of delivery, just the same, six, seven stages. We have a series of standards and methodologies that we've always had, the blue, the green, and the pink <coughs> documents. This is where you should have done it, but we never really followed. And we deliver over to the client into OPEX. We don't deliver very much. So the push process that we've always had was in was not uh, what we actually wanted to deliver the information properly. The change has been that the client now has to understand what he does. <coughs> and he must procure that by saying who is going to deliver it and at what stage in the process. So there is, in the contract, a responsibility matrix where the client, the client specifies <coughs> who will deliver what information at what stage. And it must be delivered at those stages. It is a cumulative, it is not just a quick done at the end of the day. So the change from what we always did is that the client now has to be active and must tell us what he wants. Not a big change. It doesn't change the contractual condition very much. It certainly doesn't affect the insurance because the, the insurers love this. It is a managed process and it apportions responsibility. What also goes with it is what is the data and the information that we want and what level of detail graphically and what level of information do we really need. So it can be at the first stage sim symbolic. It could be generic. It could be a little bit more detail in there. It could be the thing I'm actually going to build. It is what I build. It is what I deliver. And there are 
there is information associated with the object. However, there's a lot of other information, now data that are de delivered, which is additional to the graphical representation. So this is known as the level of detail graphically and the level of information. This is what I want to know about this building at this time. So you can see that the data sets associated with the model, usually through a relation of those ways, is growing, and the way in which it's delivered through the Kobe spreadsheets. And at the end of the delivery, it's everything. It's the 3D model, it's the documents, it's the drawing, it's the data. It's everything that records what happened and what was produced in the delivery of the product. <coughs> the full history. Okay. One of the things that people really need to understand, <coughs> this is one of the first documents where it needed to be understood. The industry resists. I am not going to share my information <coughs> because you're going to change it. Somebody else will use it for a purpose <coughs> that I haven't specified. This has been sorted out and had this publication from the CRC has been around to talk to the insurers. There is no reason why you should not share your information. In fact, they say we want you to as long as you use the BS1192 <coughs> processes to deliver it. Because it shows us where the responsibility lies and who should have delivered it. So we try to clear away in this set of documents all of the blockers in the delivery. I'm not going to go into that too much. Uh, this is just some of the statements and some of the simple things that you need to put up there for the insurers. One of the things that comes out of this is that they want you to use BS 1192 and PAS 1192. If you use any other bespoke process that you can find a myriad of them on the internet and they're free and they're written by people who really understand it, it doesn't actually, none of them have been proven to work. None of them have been tried and tested. So the insurer, if you don't use BS 1192 or PAS 1192, and you think you've got a better process, you must tell your insurer what you're doing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As I said, technology is a killer. And insurers. Okay. So the process set out the president for the specification for information management, blah, blah, blah. Uh, gives further comfort to the insurers with regards to the trail of custody and responsibility for delivery of information. So, go into your offices now, and if anybody says, I'm not going to share my information, you might change it. I would, no, no. They want you to share it, and you must share it in this active. The next thing is the roles and responsibilities, is to understand what our responsibilities are in delivering this information. These are not job titles, by the way. These are roles. So we have the role of the project delivery manager, and we have a role of the project information manager. The project delivery manager is somebody that sets up the project and plan to coordinate the design delivery against the construction pull. So the teams, any given task team, must tell him what they're going to produce, when they're going to produce it, and he sets it against the needs for others who are going to use that data against the delivery of that information so construction will start on the right date. So the project delivery manager really is about the timely delivery. The project information management role is about what am I going to deliver in this bottom thing to the client, what is the information, the data I need to, to, to deliver, and in what formats must I deliver it. So time and content. Within the project team, or within the task team, there is also an information manager. The information manager makes sure that the team, which are the individual teams, work to the agreed standards, methods and protocols. And also to ensure that all information is checked for CAD, for design technical content, and for data content. Yeah? And he gets the team manager to check it, review it, and sign it off to say that it is suitable for use before you share it with other team members. If that process is not followed, 
then the information manager has a responsibility to the project information manager to tell him that somebody is not playing the game. Naughty boys, could you please come down here and smack somebody's wrist? Because if the stuff isn't checked off against the agreed process and protocols, error will come into the system, into, into the data set, and we will be generating even more erroneous information from the erroneous information that's been put in there. So this is a process that must work from top to bottom. BIM, the only time it occurs in this document is the BIM author. We didn't know any other way to describe it. These are people that produce anything. Data, documents, drawings, or models. It is all BIM in that sense. So it's the only time it occurs. We also have the role of the interface management or interface manager. And that is when you federate your models, and they all have to fit together. If for some reason, let's say the vertical circulation, the lift shaft, the staircase suddenly needs more space in the building, then the interface manager must coordinate with whoever usually the architect, the volume strategy, I need more space, somebody else has got to lose some space, you have to go through this interface management activity <coughs> and say, yes, I can release more space. And this is something that doesn't occur. People just make changes to their models without telling anybody else what they've done. I know of a lift shaft on a certain building, which is a different size at each floor. And the lift that had to go in there eventually was smaller than the original design because we had to find one small enough to go up from the free space as this lift shaft <laughs> went up the building. That is not a joke, but it sounds like one. It actually happens, and I could take you there. In fact, if you get on an aeroplane, you almost likely go up and down it at some time or another. <laughs> okay. So, these are the roles, not titles. So we don't want people rushing out saying, oh, I'm going to be a PIM, I want to get more money. I'm now a project information manager. It's not, it's about the responsibility of carrying out those roles that you're assigned. Not about changing the name of who you are. Some of the things that the project information manager will have to do is to set up and provide the common data environment. We haven't spoken about this yet. Please bear with me. Initiate and agree uh, and implement the project information plan. So what is it we need to do? How are we going to do it? What are the formats we're going to use? And how are we going to check it? So all of these things have to be agreed. The process for incorporating as constructed, tested, validated, and commissioned information into the model. There is not one set of models. There are three. There is the design intent information. Yeah. There is the models that are then rebuilt by the specialist designers, the MBEs and the P's, not the consultants' information, but what we're actually going to build. And then as we build it, we need to record if that is actually what we built and it's in the right place. So we then have at the delivery the construction record model. So there are three elements. <coughs> why do we need a construction record model? And why must it be accurate? Well, if we look at some of the evolving technologies that we want to use, Three, if you like. We have such things as immersive technologies. We have the iPad where you can hold it up in front of the building and go, oh look, there it is. And as you move it around, you basically x-ray the walls and the ceiling to see what services there are behind the panels. So when you're in a maintenance activity and you want to know where something is, oh, there it is. Let's take that panel down because what I want to get to is behind there. You take the panel down, and there is nothing there. You've now got to go and search the building to find out where the control panels, the pumps, whatever are. They're not where they are supposed to be. So unless we build this and record what we built, we won't be able to use it in the asset information maintenance activity, in using some of these technologies that are available to us, even now on our iPads, iPads, whatever. So there is a, a forward-thinking um, activity going on here in Europe. So what is the common data environment? I'm going to miss that out if I may, because I think that is another subject. 
just quickly to show you what the commendation of Rodman is, it's basically from this diagram. Why did this diagram appear? People can generate information in their own offices, with their own systems and methods. But before they share them with other disciplines, architect sharing with structural engineer, they must go through a review, a check, review, and approval process. This is right. It's CAD correct, it's clash detected, it's technical content is right, and I am going to allow others to use it against the suitability that I'm going to specify. You may only use this information for spatial coordination. You may only use this information for material scheduling. So the author has control of what his information is used for. Getting over the problem of I don't want to share it with somebody else, they're likely to change it. So you have to build trust. And that's what this is doing. Where does the trust come from? It comes from the archive. The archive is actually a record of every single transaction that occurs in the development and delivery of the project. So if somebody produces a model, puts it into shared, and then says, you know, somebody's changed my model. Who did that? We can go to the archive, and it will give us all the information of who accessed the information, who changed it, if indeed it occurred. So this is really the policeman. It's also something else. This is what the insurers want to see when the building collapses. Because they want to know what all the decisions were that were made that brought this problem about. So there's lots of reasons why this archive, we call it an archive because it's less sensitive than an audit trail. The flight recorder. Sorry? It's the flight, the flight recorder. recorder. Absolutely correct. <coughs> so in this sharing activity, which is very iterative, you are reusing people's information, not redrawing it. And once you reach a milestone, you use the signed off information to generate your other information, documents or whatever, and you go through a check process, perhaps the client is involved in it, to say, yes, this is what I want you to build, I'm happy with this, I'm willing to pay for it, and then it is published as a contractual document. So the common data environment is a tool, a digital tool, that manages the delivery of information and maintains the audit trail of how it was produced and how it was checked. Okay, that's all it is. But it becomes a very important part of everything. In fact, we're developing the next stage of these tools that will actually manage the whole delivery from the EIR through the assessment of the teams to the selection of the winning team through these processes and the final delivery. Because what we need to do out of the back end of this is to check that what you're delivering, we need to validate it and check it to make sure A, that you've delivered what we asked for, and B, to say, is it within the, the, uh, the, the numbers that we're expecting. We may not be able to check the absolute answer, but we know what the range should be that uh, that information should fulfill. So there's a lot of other garbage around the outside. Um, read, if, if I could, uh, this, this document. It's been extended in the past, because everybody went, ah, oh, yes, this is only about design. We don't have to use it when we get to construction. Yes, you do. So, all we've done is, everybody thinks that Lewis is the designer, well it is, but there's specialist designers as well. Maybe, maybe procured at a different stage. So the client is procuring its design team, the output from the design team is some validated data, the, the contractor will then put together his supply chain to complete the design, might be an 80-20 situation. It is working on the shared, same shared information that the design team has had. So we are managing the whole process, as I've said, these three models, from design intent to design construction, this is what I'm going to deliver, and we will also be looking out of there the updating of the model as, to, as a record of what we've delivered. And the output will be verified and validated information in terms of the drawing, the models, the drawing, the data, etc. And it has to go through an acceptance process by the client into OPEX. So this is a totally managed operation. What's the next blocker? The next blocker is, I'm an architect and I use this software, I'm a structural engineer and I use this software, and I'm an MEP and I use this software, and therefore we can't follow this process 
because our information is not compatible. Well, so the processes in the PAS show you how to do that with incompatible and in inoperable information. So we've covered that one as well. You can still follow the process in a different way using a different format of information, but the process is the same. So we're knocking these things off one at a time. There is no reason why you should not collaborate to deliver this. So the process is simple and the procedures create a disciplined approach to the delivery of design and construction. And the process, once again, is stating it is equally capable of managing the development and sign-up process for any additional information, data, etc., etc., and across any construction, production, <coughs> project. It works, we know it works, for any type of construction activity. There are a lot of documents out there, seven of them, <coughs> form level two. I'm going to skip past that. Get down to the hazy diagram. This was uh, this is what we're working towards. <coughs> this diagram was produced in 2008 by Mark View and myself to try to uh, get um, his company at that time the board of directors to understand what the problem was, what the challenge was, uh, and what we would have to do uh, to update and upskill that company's uh, staff. All this really, and there's a lot of discussion on the web about this, by the way. You know, I don't understand it. You know, what does the, what does the y axis and what does the z axis mean? But nothing to do with that, it's just a graphic. It's not a graph. All it's saying is there was a time when we were producing. Had and we know what the problems were. It was mainly out, it was paper, and it was inaccurate. And there is another line down here which says, and it costs us 25% more to deliver it, to deliver the program. We move into the use of the 2D, 3D CAD technologies, visualization, and I can produce a really nice drawing for my next interview. The quality of that information didn't really change. So we had to write a series of processes and methodologies which I've gone through to deliver it. What the government wants to do is to bring everybody to level two. That is to upskill all of the trading edge of the industry up to the same point of delivery. Generating or getting rid of all of that waste. That's all the processes are about. At the moment, the software and things that usually are an architectural information model, a structural information model, uh, a finite element or, or a uh, facilities information model, um, a building services information, and what I love of all is a broom. The industry in selling us technology comes up with some wonderful things. Anybody want to any guess on what a broom is? No? Don't get the IM is information model. It is a bridge information model. So basically, the vendors are selling us lots and lots of technologies. The reason why these are in vertical slots is there is very little interoperability <coughs> across those programs. Interoperability is a big thing in moving this to level two. And that is through the IFCs, the Industry Foundation Classes. A lot of work still needed there to deliver it. To get to level two, there are seven documents that you must comply with. Okay. At the moment, nobody can get to level two. So if you see in the magazines and reports, I'm at level three or I'm at level four, and we've even heard somebody saying they're at level seven, whatever that may be, they cannot do it because we haven't defined what it is, and therefore you cannot measure it. We have not completed all of the documents. There are two documents left to do. One is the digital plan of work. We need to finalize that. And the other one is we need to finalize the classification systems that are needed to uh, manage the data, because we have to classify the data. And they won't be published until possibly halfway through next year. So nobody can get to level two until 2015. So if you're in a company that is competing with others who are saying, we're at level three, you're off. Because they are no further ahead than you would be. Because you can only work with the information that we've published to get there. I hope that gives and certainly in a lot of these presentations, it gives people a lot of comfort. We're all on a journey. There is nobody standing there saying, 
lots of hands for everything here. Nobody is there yet. The next move into level three, which is being defined at the moment, is all about managing data within a single environment. Not a single model necessarily, but actually through distributed databases that they're all accessible. So they act as a virtual database. So mine information wherever you want to go. For instance, if you have an object in the 3D model that says, I want to know all of this, the architect in particular says, and I want it to look like this, you say, no. You do not have to generate that information to that level. Because all I need to do is on my generic object is put a URL or a URL that can go away and look at the manufacturer's website and it will show a picture of what's actually going to be in place and all of the data you need to pull down into your system. So as we move forward, we won't have to manage all of the data within the project. We will be able to access it through production, through the uh, providers, through the, uh, <coughs> the supply chain. The data will be available on their websites and we can just suck it down if we need it. So all this was trying to demonstrate at the time was, you're about here and you need to get about there. And <coughs> it is, uh, unfortunately, I'll tell you, this was just sketched up one evening, we thought it was a great idea, we put it out, we gave a presentation to the senior minister and he said, hang on a minute, if that works and you can save me 25%, I've got a pop up. I can build four hospitals or five hospitals for the price of four. You better do this. And so this simple diagram actually gave some sort of understanding and knowledge to somebody who didn't really understand what we were talking about, about being or cat. And this has gone viral, it is everywhere. And as you said, uh, everybody, what is it? And there are so many interpretations of it. So to get to level two, all of the documentation is being provided free of charge and it will not be completed until next year. But there is plenty of data and documents there for you to get on board now and start training. Okay, so those seven documents are the BIM protocol, PAS 1192 2013, PAS 1192.3.2014, published this morning, BS 1192 part 4, which is COVID, not yet published, it's out of draft, which is why I've left it black and government soft landings. And as the title of this presentation was BIM and government soft landings, I will finish uh, and coming back to that. What we're looking for on YSC Red, this is now being procured, it's out of tender, we want, the, we want a tool that manages this whole process, which will look at the EIR, the Employer's Information Requirement, the digital plan of work, and the classification system. And it will manage, it will be a digital tool available on the web, will be put into place on all government projects. What is government soft landings? It was originally Visria soft landings. It's been taken on board by the government and modified slightly. What is it about? Well, the clue is, when you deliver my project at the handover from OPEX, uh, from CAPEX into OPEX, you usually walk away and leave me with a building that did not perform in the way that I thought it was going to perform. I get a hard landing. I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to go out and procure somebody to come in and help me desnag my building. <coughs> the government soft landings is saying that this will be employed and there will be a representative or the employer will put out a representative that looks at what is it I have specified, what have you contracted to deliver, and does it satisfy my brief? And when we hand over in post occupancy and we test that building, we want all the design teams and the contractors to still maintain the responsibility to make sure that the building actually performs against the original brief. And if it doesn't, it is the responsibility of the design teams and the contractors to make sure that the building is put right. Once again, why should I?